Hey, Tribe, Chelsea and Ben here. I'm so glad that you've joined us. I apologize for the time funk. It was a mixture between miscommunication and Facebook. So here we are live talking about travel nursing. Hi, Ben. Greetings. Hello. So everybody submitted tons of questions, which is always super exciting. Um, but hopefully we can get through these and we will, um, those of you who are tuning in live, if you want to ask questions, you're welcome to, and we will get to them as the conversation flows. So Ben, you've been a nurse for eight years in neurotrauma, right? Absolutely. So um, for three? you've got it. Yeah. So I've been a nurse total for eight. And my bread and butter, where I have the most of my ICU experience, is neurotrauma neurosurgery ICU. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And I know you have a passion for mentorship, which we will also get into. And I'm sure you'll sprinkle it in throughout our time discussing um, the other questions that people have. But just go ahead and introduce yourself. Anything you feel like is important for us to know before we really dive in. Yeah, great. Awesome. So, you know, as uh, Chelsea mentioned, I have been a nurse for eight. I've been traveling for three. I uh, started being a nurse, you know, I got into nursing out of a passion uh, for just doing for others what they're unable to do for themselves. And that's something that I always like to recommend to new nurses is like find a passion, find a reason why, because that's going to get you through those hard days. Mm -hmm. And and so I was fortunate to have an early experience uh, when I was in high school that really gave me a strong passion, a strong reason why. And so I love bedside nursing and love traveling i'm super i'm really looking forward to this conversation like i love giving out tips and helping and everything involved so this is going to be exciting it is and so many people ask such great questions so i can't wait to answer everybody's questions but first as an icebreaker i always like to ask what your funniest nursing story is yes yes that's a really good question so I, I have so many. There's so many. Um, one that I that like sticks out in mind is um, I, ha I actually have a few that I, I'm like thinking of pulling from, but um, <laughs> so in in neuro, like you have the wildest patients, right? And we had this one guy that was on the unit. And I can't remember what his injury was, but he had a TBI okay. and he kind of like recovered in neuro ICU. And then he gets moved over to the neurovascular unit, kind of our neuro step down. And this guy was wild. And so they're trying to like mobilize this guy, you know, PTOT and they're walking him in the hall mm -hmm. and he just like makes a break for it. And so he's really recovered. Well, he's built up a lot of strength and he's just like running down the hall, you know, like gowns, open like butt cheeks are flapping in the wind <laughs> and, and he he's like running around the hall and he finally slows down they think they're gonna catch him and he squats down in front of the nurse manager's office and takes a giant dump right in front of the door of the nurse manager's office all right and and so i mean what about i mean if, if the ice isn't broken now i don't think it's ever like we just that's so funny big iceberg just fell off that is, so awesome. that is so awesome. And, and your nurse manager walks out to this gift on her doorstep. That is so funny. Yeah. All Very right. Nice. So when did you, after that awesome story, um, we'll move into the real meat and potatoes of this. So when did you realize you had a passion for travel nursing specifically? Yeah. So that's a great, great question. So I did a couple years, a little over two years of neuro ICU and have always liked vacationing, traveling, seeing new places. Mm -hmm. I had a few friends out west, and I was actually trying, also trying to pay down my student debt and mm -hmm. car loan, et cetera. And I'm like, why not do travel nursing? So I had a few different reasons to go. I wanted to live on the west coast. You know, it's a place where I've always really enjoyed vacationing. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to learn Spanish, like mm -hmm. increase my Spanish. I, I knew some, but I wanted to really develop it. And Southern California is a perfect spot for that. Yeah. I had a few friends in the LA area. And then of course you get like, you can have that increased pay as well as a traveler. So all of that combined, I packed my stuff up and I drove from Michigan to LA in my car 
and brought my whole life with me and lived in LA for a little while and worked in LA in hospitals and did the travel nursing thing and just jumped right in. That's awesome. So I don't know that you'll have a direct answer to this and I'll be able to chime in a little bit too, but Brittany and Annalisa both asked what specialties most commonly utilize travel nurses. So what's your take on that? Yeah, so that's a great question, Chelsea. Uh, ICU is really common. Like the need is always high <clears throat> and I can't speak to the med surge side of things, but I know that there's a lot of avail uh, availability in both of those. And what happens in travel nursing is like, I'm a narrow trauma neuro ICU nurse, but I get used in every other area, okay. you know? And so you don't see specialties recruited as much, so much as you do, are you ICU or are you med surge? Okay. And so when you go into an assignment, even if it's like your contract for a neuro ICU, a lot of times travelers are the first ones to float. Right. And so you end up like my first contract in, in, um, in California, I was contracted on a cardiac step down unit, but I ended up working their ICUs more than I was actually on the cardiac step down. Cause I was first to float. Mm -hmm. But, um, if you are, if you do have, I'll end it with this. If you do have the specialties, like if you can do OR or if you can do cath lab, some of those like really niche areas, like sometimes OB, you know, if you have those really niche areas, then you can get some contracts that are like more lucrative. I agree with that. And also if you're flexible in terms of where you want to go, the options really are endless, but if you have a specific, like for you, you really want to be on the West coast. I did that too. As a traveler, I was like, I really want to be on the West coast. And so when they say you're going to this little rinky dink hospital, you have to be okay with that. If you want the huge children's hospital or trauma, trauma one center, then your options might be a little bit limited, but uh, it just depends on your desires and what you're okay with. I was a PICU nurse. And so you know, that specialty is super, super unique, right? There's not a ton of PICU nurses and not every hospital has a PICU. And so you really limit yourself. If your goal is to travel nurse, do something a little bit more broad where like Ben, he can go to all the different ICUs. I couldn't, you can't put me in adult ICU as a PICU nurse, that doesn't work. So I was able to do a little bit of NICU um, cross training prior to starting out as a traveler, which I highly recommend if you are in a unique specialty like NICU or pick you do some cross training join a prn float pool so that you get your feet wet and if you needed to take a peds assignment you could do that if you needed to take a pick you assignment or a nicu assignment you can do that so um open your doors a little bit by doing some float pool assignments which um you can do at your home unit um you just need to be a little bit creative so recruiters are awesome about giving you options in terms of suggestions and maybe what you could do in order to broaden your pool of options once you're ready to travel um just reach out to them and if you want specifics about those things just uh probably reach out to ben or i so we can kind of point you to our favorite recruiter but that's that Okay, so if you were going to point out the best place for a person who says, I want to travel, in goal, I want to be a traveler, what unit would you suggest they start on? The best way to, to do it, if you just want the most direct route, is to go into flow pool. Yeah. Like, you can start in flow pool as a new nurse. And it's actually a really good spot to learn to start because you see everything, and then you can maybe find a unit that you want to specialize in, or you can just stay in flow pool. So either ICU float, I've had nurses right out of nursing school, I've seen them start right in ICU float or med surge float. That's the most direct way. That's the best way to do it. And after my, after I worked in neurotrauma for a couple of years, I went and I did ICU float for a little over a year, just because neuro is so specific, right. you know, to get, to round myself out and prepare myself for traveling. Uh, and so that's the best suggestion. Like it's going to really lower your learning curve, it's going to speed your learning curve. If you can go into a float specialty and you're going to be more marketable and your, your assignment's going to be way more fluid as well. That's really good advice. I think honestly that that idea of going into float pool as a new grad is relatively new. Um, when I started 15 years ago, that was not an option. Like you didn't go into 
a new nurse, a new grad didn't start in the float pool, but I've seen several people talk about it in the group and um, that must be relatively new. I wonder, I don't know, maybe you can speak of this. What are their orientations like? I got 12 weeks straight orientation on my unit as a PICU nurse. What does yeah. a float nurse look like? So when I oriented to float pool, I did, I did a month, basically. I did a month on each unit. Oh, well, that's really good. Yeah. So I did, and you weren't a new grad. Do you know if the new grad orientation is similar? I think it was, I think it was similar. You know, okay. I already had neuro ICU, so I, right. I didn't do any rotation on neuro ICU and I actually had an expedited orientation. Okay. I did less time in trauma because that was our sister unit. And so we floated a tra the trauma ICU often anyways. And so I had less time, but it was like, you get like four, three or four weeks on day shift for each unit. And then you do one or two weeks on night shift for each unit. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So Kay asked, are there any agencies that will hire new grads or nurses with only one year experience? So two is the preference. You know, most agencies will say do two years, which is actually, it's actually a great suggestion, honestly. I know like you feel like the, the time is ticking away and the years are slipping by, but I mean, I would never suggest less than a year. Like I would just say hard pass, hard stop, minimum, bare minimum a year. Cause you're just like, you, you think about a year and it seems like a long time, but there's so many, there's so much development that happens as a nurse in the first year and even beyond, you know, that really the two year mark, you, when you when you're a travel nurse, like minimal, minimal orientation where I'm at in California, I took a full assignment on my first day, right? which actually isn't very common. Usually you get at least one day of orientation, but think about that. Like you have to be prepped and ready. You have to be, you know, you have to be performance ready on day one. Yeah. And so you, the two years is, is really, really important. Um, in terms of agencies that accept less than two, I'm sure that you could sell yourself, you know, in terms like so, brag about yourself, sell yourself to the agency in terms of, yeah, I've only been a nurse a year, but here's why I'm ready. And they would make an exception. You know, I, I think that it's kind of a soft two year requirement. If you talk to the right person, you could probably get that swapped. But I would, I mean, just get the two years in, you know, you're going to benefit, your patients are going to benefit. That's the end goal, right? Like you don't want to ever, the end goal and the top goal is that you provide the highest level of care to your patients. And so yeah. if you need that, those two years to do so, it's totally worth it. I agree. And I'm just going to say this, you work hard for your license. You would hate to step out there, get to a contract and you get one shift, one shift, not 12 weeks, one shift of orientation. They say, here's the supply closet. Here's how you access your meds. Here's our charting system. Go. That's it. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not like they're holding your hand and walking you through how to assess a patient. And not that you wouldn't have that down by a year's experience. But I don't know if you have the same experience. But after I went through nursing school, I feel like, okay, I know a little bit about all the things. But mm -hmm. now you step on your unit and you're like, I know nothing about any of the things. <laughs> yeah. It's just completely different. You have this little bit of knowledge about everything and then you come into learning critical thinking and yeah. deep patient assessment. It's not this yeah. service level stuff anymore. And so I just, I would honestly say to you, if you're interested in traveling, really get a solid understanding. Don't try and cheat yourself or like Ben said, your patients by getting out there early. It's just not a good idea. Okay. You. So, um, Sheree asks, how do you specialize in neurotrauma? Is it an ICU type job or a department? So specializing in she asked about neuro ICU. Yeah, she okay. um, just for those of you who are tuning in, just know we've got students and highly experienced nurses tuning in. So some of the questions might be um, on either end of the spectrum. So this must be a student, I would assume. I love it. Love it. Yeah. So I love neuro ICU. So I'll talk about neuro ICU all day long. Okay. And neuro ICU, as an aside, is very polarizing. Like people either love it or they hate it. Similar with CVICU, you know, like they're both really specific specialties. Right. And I think a lot of that polarization comes from like proximity 
you know, like if you're not close to it and you don't fully understand it, you shy away from it. Sure. Once you learn about it in depth, then it becomes super interesting and it's an awesome field. So I'm excited that she's interested in neuro ICU. So the way, the usual way that you would end up specializing in neuro ICU is basically just getting a job on the unit, you know, apply to the unit, get the job, and then you get on the job training. Um, and That's so unit in nursing. Yeah. That's how you specialize. You get a job there. And yeah, they- absolutely. So you just, you like almost like passively specialize just because you get the job on the job training right. and that ends up, if you like it and you stay there, then you're specialized. I think so many people envision doctors who go to residencies and have this mm-hmm. special training. It's nothing like that. In nursing, you're trained on the job and now all of a sudden you're specialized. That's all mm-hmm. there is to it. Okay, so Mary and Kayla also asked, how do you find a reliable agency? What's a good indicator of a reputable travel agency? Any specific recommendations? Mm -hmm. So a recruiter makes a huge difference, especially on the front end of things. Once they get you all set up, usually contact with them is minimal until you're ready for another assignment. Mm -hmm. But a really good recruiter makes the difference on the front end. I'm going to cough here for a second. <coughs> um, and what you'll see a good recruiter do for you is they're going to be an advocate. They're going to, if you say, this is what I need and this is why I need it, and you're making like reasonable asks, they're going to pull for you and really like, even in, even when there's red tape, like they're okay crossing that red tape to get you what you need, you know? And so building a relationship with them is really important. Seeing that they're attentive is a good sign, but how do you find that person? You know, because like the thing that you'll see is like, if you ask somebody for a recruiter recommendation, a lot of times they're going to, they're going to, they're going to recommend their recruiter because they get a monetary kickback. And it's who they have experience with. So that's understanding. But one thing that I will recommend for those of you that are trying to find a good recruiter, if you go into a group and say, who has a great recruiter, you're going to get like 90 comments of like, I've got a good recruiter, you know? So it's okay to do that. But what you really need to be asking is not who has a good recruiter. You need to be asking why is your recruiter good? Yeah. Because you want to see the reasons, you know, like everybody's going to vouch for their recruiter because of the monetary kickback and what you need to, like I said, know why are they good? So when I do that, when I'm maybe switching assignments or switching agencies, it's a good idea to have two because then you have more options and sometimes you can get them to compete with each other. And then when businesses compete, the consumer wins. Um, So what I'll do is... I'll get like three or four people out of that thread and I'll message them and say, why do you like your recruiter? And, mm-hmm. and then if it sounds legit, then I'll reach out to them. And I, then I think there's one more part to that question. Did I answer the whole thing? Let's see. Oh, any specific indicator. But I think honestly that varies by you as a person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because yeah. I had three different agencies I traveled with as a traveler. I traveled for four years. Um, and like you were saying, having that competitor factor, but I found one that I loved. And if he had that company overall, like the company was wonderful. The benefits were great. The pay was great. The housing was good. It was like an overarching, I want to go with them if I can. But if they didn't have an assignment in the area that I wanted to be in at that time of year, well, then I went with another agency. Was it as good of a contract? Not really, but it worked. And so it really depends on what you are valuing as the traveler. Um, I love that my recruiter didn't contact me. I had one recruiter that contacted me incessantly from the day I signed my contract to the day I signed another contract. And I could not stand that. Like, please, I don't need a job talking to you. Like, that's exhausting. But some people really like that. They love that that checking in and seeing how you're going. I could care less. Like, please don't contact me. You know, like, please, no. Um, but you might like that. So it really just depends on the person, right? Yeah, 
agree a hundred percent. You know, there's different levels of communication. Like you mentioned, I like that. You know, I think that's a really good take on it is that like, you need to find one that fits you and your first assignment. You might not have a great recruiter, but it's like easy to just, you know, it's minimal effort. It does take effort, but it, it's not, it's not the end of the world to find another recruiter. So just, you might have to sample two or three until you find one that fits and like go with, recommendations like that's the best thing like i love like it's such a dad move but like i love um looking at uh what's it called like when like uh reviews i don't know why i blanked on that i love looking at reviews you know like dads just love reviews and it's such a dad move but i love looking at reviews and so get those recommendations talk to people get them to tell you what qualities they like about the recruiter and you're gonna get a you'll 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 get to the to actually having a good one a lot faster than just, you know, jumping in or what have you. Agreed. Um, Michaela asked, do you tell them that you are working with more than one agency? I think that's fine. Yeah. You I know, do. you don't need to be secretive about it. Like mm -hmm. just let them know that you have another offer. It happens to them all the time. Like yep. they're not going to hold, if they, if they get grumpy about it, then maybe that's just an indication that you're not a good match with that recruiter. I agree. I feel like transparency in all of life really is um, super important, whether you're communicating with a new job and whatever it is, I feel like transparency is um, key. Yeah. You don't forget what you told one person and not the other person. Just lay it out there so that there's no surprises at the end of the day. There's no, mm. there's no preference. Yeah, you're right. Open communication always pays dividends. Yeah, I agree. So Tara asked, do you go through a company or did you ever obtain your own placement yourself? um and not with a travel company so there is the possibility to there are agencies that cut out the middleman yeah and you end up being like you do your own subcontracting there's groups on facebook where you can jump in there and they kind of show you how to do that mm -hmm. and it is more lucrative so if you're just going for the going for the the checks then um you know that's a good that can be a good route for you but you also like on the downside, you don't get as much support. Like you don't have any of the support staff. Like you don't have anybody, you're in charge of your own compliance. There's way more responsibility. And also um, your options are limited as to where you can go. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Some big hospitals specifically, they are bound by contracts specifically with various travel agencies. So they can't hire independent workers. Now, if you wanted to crawl, call some little rinky dink hospitals out in the middle of nowhere, you could maybe get contracts, just call directly to their HR office, say, hey, I'm a traveler. Do you have any assignments in whatever area you specialize in? And there you go. Um, but like Ben saying, it's just a little bit more legwork on your part, but super lucrative. I found my own housing when I was a traveler, even though I had an agency. A lot of people who work with an agency utilize their traveling um, options and their housing options. And if you are going to go that route, then that adds a little bit more simplicity for you as a traveler. One tip I have off of that, Chelsea, I'm glad you mentioned that. One thing that I do is I made like a little simple flyer and it says, Hey, I'm Ben. I'm coming to your unit to work for a contract. I'm looking for housing. If you have an open room or you know somebody with an open room, here's like my socials so you can be sure that I'm not a creep. Yeah. Here's my phone number, grab it, contact me. And I, every time I've sent a flyer, I've gotten a response. And a lot of times I found, I find housing at like half the going rate. Like there's a spot that like going rate was like 1200 a month and I found housing for 600. Um, so I, and I've had a similar success story. So that, that can be a really good route for people that even travelers that have been traveling for a long time don't do that. And they're always like, that's awesome. So if you guys actually, if you want to, I can send you my flyer and you can just replace your name with mine. Awesome. You should stick it in the files in the group. That'd be great. Um, something about that. I know there is a Facebook group called like Travelers Rent or something like that. And yeah. I've heard lots of people get rooms off of there and it's fellow travelers who own some sort of, you know, condo, townhome, home, whatever it is. And they're willing to rent out a room while they're off on contract. And it's kind of a win-win because you're renting a piece of their home. They're still getting their travel stipend um, for housing and everybody's helping each other. It's really nice. So I love that. You get support on both ends. 
Yeah, so. for sure. Okay, so Janet asked, any companies that specialize in short-term travel assignments four to six weeks? Those are called crisis contracts usually. Ben, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, so I know that Fast Staff, they have a, they're kind of like the go-to for that. Mm -hmm. And then there's one that's called like U.S., maybe U.S. Nursing or something. I haven't heard that one. Fast Staff is like the one that comes to mind off yeah. the top. And they'll, they'll do crisis contracts. And those are always the most lucrative. But they can also be stressful because, you know, there's like a lot of uh, animosity against travelers that go in and break strikes, which That's funny. we don't have to go like too deep into that because it's like a very opinionated, uh, like polarized conversation. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, like the patients need somebody to take care of them. So, you know, it is what it is. But um it can be more stressful to do the, 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 cause normally the crisis contracts right now we're in a different scenario, but normally a crisis contract is a, is a strike. Yeah. Um, for sure. I agree. Unless there's some really unique circumstance, but generally the ones I've heard of are strike contracts. Uh, and those tend to have really specific work schedules. Like you are going to work six days a week, 12 to 14 hour shifts. And there's just like, it's very, very laid out. And if it's just you and you're just in it for the money, then that's fine. And lots of people do really well doing it that way. Um, so it really is about what it is that you are looking for. All right. Annalisa asks, what's the average length of time you spend in one place? I I mean, the minimum standard contract is 13 weeks, mm -hmm. and the most you can spend in an area legally is like 364 days. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're employed longer than that, you end up like violating tax laws. So you can stay anywhere from th three months to a year. I've done the year thing, and I've done the 13-week thing. So a lot of it, for me, depends on, like, the crew. If I found a cool spot with, like, an amazing crew that I love, I'll just, like, max the contract out, and you end up being, like, almost like staff at that point. So You do, and you make such good friends, and you always have somewhere to go visit when you go back there. It's it's fun. I did the same thing. I did 13 weeks. I did six months, um, but you go there on a 13 week contract. And if they like you and you do a good job and you build good relationships there, then they say, hey, we still need you. Would you like to sign another contract? At that point, you can say yes or no. And um, I declined re-signing a contract before just because I didn't feel like it was a good fit. Um, and it really, again, it's just based on what you're in it for. Um, Anna asked, or Anne, sorry, not Anna, asked if you see LPNs as travelers. I've never seen that. I've never seen that happen. I don't even know if it's something that happens, but do you have any input on that, Chelsea? Yeah, it does. Um, a lot of times, long-term care facilities and skilled nursing units, um, those will hire LPNs a lot. And uh, doctor's offices, actually, they will do contract labor for um, LPNs at doctor's offices. So yeah. Awesome. If you're interested in it, go for it. Absolutely. Um, Nancy asks, what is the process of training light? We kind of addressed this, but we can go into it a little bit. How difficult is it to adapt and hit the floor running? Yeah, so that is one of the biggest challenges of travel nursing is just like for the first two weeks, not really knowing where everything is mm -hmm. and not being familiar with their process. Who do you page? What's the preference? When do you like a page? You know, some hospitals like really want you to notify everyone about everything and others are like only the critical stuff. So getting into that environment and understanding that culture is a big part of it and a big challenge. Um, if, as you continue to travel, the, the variation there and like nothing ever being standard becomes standard. Yeah. And so you just kind of adapt and you, you get to know what questions to ask, when to ask them. You need, you get to know usually like usually supply rooms are set up in like sections. And so if like you find the nasal cannula, you know that you're probably close to the ambu bags. And so you learn some of those tricks, but it is one of the top challenges. One of the top three challenges I would say is just all the difference, all the variation and having to adapt everywhere you go. Agreed. Um, the most orientation I ever got was three shifts. 
And the least I ever got was one shift. So that amount of, oh, so you change your central line dressings every three days? Oh, you guys change them every seven. Oh, and you change lines every 24? Oh, and you change lines every 72. All right, got it. You got your little notepad and you just jot down those little specifics because like, Ben said it's different everywhere you go and you just say okay well at my old facility no none of that you just say okay you're there for 13 weeks <laughs> yeah that's right. like one of the best things you can do as a travel nurse is to just flow with it like if your patient isn't in danger just say okay and do it because it's like nobody wants to hear how this is better at this hospital and like people don't want their hospital put down. So, right. and it, and even if you're not doing it that for that reason, it can come across that way. Yeah. So I always just say, however you guys do it is how I'd like to do it. So let me know. Yeah. Agreed. And you know, once you get there and you're like these little chlorhexidine patches that they had at my life's assignment were really cool. I don't know if you guys have inventory for something like that, but you might want to look into it. It's just as you get to know the people then and you've learned something, sometimes they're really open to it, but you've learned those people who are interested and who are totally not interested and you just kind of stay away. I love that you kind of stay out of the drama and the, I don't know, muck. You're just there for 13 weeks and you just leave. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Michaela asked, what about nurse practitioners as travelers? Have you seen that? Yeah, that happens. Mm -hmm. um, when you get to the higher level, like more provider level, sometimes they call them locums. Yes. But, um, you know, that happens for sure. Like NP travel is available, you know, PA physicians, there's travel physicians. So that's, there's definitely a market for that. Yep. Agreed. So can family and spouse come with, or is that a no, no? Asked Diana. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's up. It's it's probably a conversation more so like the willingness of the spouse, you right? Know? <laughs> like, I, absolutely. You know, I think that's really cool when couples travel together, and like if you can bring your support system, that's huge. You know, yeah, that's yeah. going to be a massive benefit. So I would say if you can find a way to do it, then jump on it. I traveled with my family and I traveled without my family in the opposite order. Um, I loved traveling with my family. My two boys and my husband came along and it was so much fun. My husband worked from home. And so although it was a little messy because he was taking care of the kids when I was working and then vice versa, um, it, it worked out really nice and we had a blast exploring on my days off. So it's definitely an option. Um, you definitely have to find your own housing because your agency isn't housing a three bedroom house, condo, whatever it is that you need. They're going to house your one bedroom or a loft or whatever. Like they don't have that sort of allowance available for you. So you're probably going to out of pocket a little bit of living expenses unless you're really good. And my husband found us housing where our stipend covered it and it was amazing, but you just have to be uh, creative sometimes. So yes, absolutely. Um, Diana says partner works from home. So it'd be great. Heck yeah, Diana, do it. I'm telling you, it's amazing. Do it. If you have questions, you can message me privately. Okay, so Brittany asked, how hard is it to be a travel nurse? I know each state has their own practice act and can be different than other states. So in terms of practice act, it's more so uh, managed at the hospital level. And so I've never ran into problems with like state practice. Yeah. More so the challenge is, is just understanding the processes, the protocols, the procedures within each hospital. And so, you know, as we mentioned earlier, that is a one of the top three challenges is learning those as fast as you can so that, you know, you're operating within how the hospital wants you to operate. You don't ever want to target on your rack. And sometimes it's small things that can do that. And so adapting quick and practicing, you know, within the book is uh, a really good way to have more enjoyment in your contract because you know, you're going to be a better fit for the team and be able to help them a little better without them having to mention A, B, C, or D, even if you're practicing safely, you know, they have their ways of doing it. Yeah, that's true. You know, RN practice doesn't change a lot state to state, but, um, 
nurse practitioner and LPN, their guidelines change quite a bit more. So if I were to advise you as a practitioner in any role, really, but I kind of went with what Ben did and we just learned from the other staff, you just got to know what questions to ask. And so that's another reason why your previous experience is vital to your license as well as your patient safety. Uh, let's see. Oh, Michaela, we'll talk about homeschooling and that kind of thing regarding traveling with your family another time. We have so many questions. I don't want to keep Ben too much longer. So um, Margo asks, is it hard to always be the new kid at the facilities? And I think we've already addressed that. Do you have anything else to add, Ben? Yeah, the, you know, what I do is I first two or three weeks, I just like put my nose to the grindstone, help as many people as I can. Mm -hmm establish no like and trust they need to know you uh trust you and then the like can happen last yeah. but knowing and trusting you is first and foremost and then once i have some no like and trust built two or three weeks in or whatever you know i still know the grindstone and helping out as much as i can but then i am able to you know kind of be a little bit more of myself. I'm a lot quieter when I first start a contract and just focus on helping, yeah. you know, and then once they know me a little bit more, then you can get a little more comfortable with developing relationships with staff and this, that, the other. But um, that's the best way I've found to being the new kid is, you know, approaching the contract in that way. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. What would you say the top three challenges are? So we talked about one of them in detail and that's the adaptability. Mm -hmm. Adaptability is top, one of the top three. Um, ha everything being new is a big challenge. Um, but, you know, as we said, as you do new more and more often, that becomes the regular. That becomes the pattern. Yeah. Like the irregular becomes the pattern. Uh, and so that, that when that kicks in, that's really helpful. Probably like for me, maybe like my third or fourth contract, I started feeling that way. Mm -hmm. uh, another big challenge is is um the being the new kid you know what we just said being the new kid not having like the camaraderie that you would have on a core staff unit you know that's not there and you really have to be respectful of depending on your personality style you know like you have to be respectful of of you know kind of the pecking order on the unit and just be supportive you know that's like the best advice i can give is just be like super supportive staff, help as much as you can, uh, give as much as you can, contribute as much as you can. And that's another reason why it's important to do the two years, because not only do you want to be able to take care of your patients, but it's also super helpful if you can jump in with other people and help them. Yes. And being strong in your practice is key to that happening. And then I would say the, the third um, is, for me at least, is, well, uh, let me go this route. Probably the other part, well, for me is being, having like isolation from your friend groups because like, I love my friends. Like if there's one thing I'll brag about myself is that like, I have an amazing group of friends back in Michigan, you know, my home spot. And so being separated from them and family, you know, like my family lives across like three different States. So for me, you know, I'm isolated from them in, in some shape way or form all the time. Mm -hmm. But being isolated from your support group can be tough because you're just out there, you know, like humans were designed for human connection, you know? So having without not having that can be a challenge. Um, and then I guess like my bonus third is uh, making sure that you steward your finances so that if you want one or two weeks off between contracts, you have the cash to do that because in, in other times you should just have that anyways because sometimes a contract will fall through and then you're scrambling to find one and when you're not getting work you're not working when you're not working you're not getting paid so that can be another challenge too if you don't have like two weeks of expenses saved up that can get hairy completely agree with all of that and i would say um the loneliness that you mentioned i found that if other travelers were also on assignment there getting some camaraderie with them was so key because they know your perspective. They know where you're coming from. And if they've been doing it a little bit longer than you, it's really nice. They have, you can learn from them. 
And so um, that's another advantage, which I actually never took advantage of, is letting your agency house you. A lot of times they house you with other travelers, which can be super convenient and so building um, in terms of loneliness and whatnot. You are off and your fellow housemates are off too. And that's really cool when you guys can go out and explore together. You're all new to the area and stuff. So um, I totally agree with everything you said. Margot asked, how often are travel nurses given the worst assignments on purpose in your experience? So for me, that honestly, that hasn't happened a ton. You know, it happened to me on my first contract in California. And it can be frustrating because, like, you're there to contribute just as much as anybody else. And, you know, I won't get too much into it because I'll get fired up. But, uh, you know, it doesn't happen that often. Usually it's a pretty good mix. And oftentimes the frustrating part or what can be frustrating is that you don't really get high acuity Yes. that often because the core staff get all the acute patients, which makes sense. Like they know the process more streamlined. That patient, you know, can get more streamlined care in that regard. But that mm-hmm. can be a frustrating thing, especially if your ICU is like you, you – uh, uh, until you have no like and trust, like maybe halfway through your contract, once they, once you're able to flex a little bit, like humble brag and flex and show them you can contribute, then they'll start giving you heavier assignments yep. um, and more acute assignments. But. Yeah. When that patient codes, go in and be right there. Do, do your thing, show your knowledge because then they're like, Oh, you can give them that crashing patient. They'll be okay. But yeah. before that, they're not risking their, they want to make sure most often, most often they're, heart is taking care of these patients. And so your ego and wanting the second, second, sickest patient, they don't care. They don't know you. They don't know that you can take care of this really sick patient. So they're not going to assign you that really sick patient. They don't want that. They might assign you to the grumpy old man who complains constantly and is always on the call late because everyone else is like, he's not that one. Um, And you know what? That's just part of you're there for having their back and they need that relief from that chronic patient that's been there for months and months and months. And you know what? You just take it. You say, yeah, I'm fine with it. This is 13 weeks of my life. I'm here to help you guys. And we're good. I can take the grumpy old man. It's fine. The more you show them that you're there to help them, that you'll be great. Yeah. Just flow with everything. Take the the bad patient. Don't complain. Be happy about it. Yep. You know, it's just 12 hours and 12 hours. it's so helpful. That's yep. really good advice. Yeah. All right. So several nurses asked or people asked if you had an assignment out of the U.S. or U.S. territories and you haven't, right? I haven't. I've, com- I've you know, had communication with people that have. The cool thing about you can go to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And that's pretty common. And they do, you know, there's a need there. Uh, oftentimes you're within like a compound basically when you're there and it's, it's like a a city in itself. Like the hospital um, has, you know, kind of its own city and it's a protected area because there's a lot like the female male rules in Saudi Arabia are really different, but within the compound, you don't have to abide by those. And um, also there's no taxes. So you get to like, you get to keep everything you make. So I don't know all the rules in that, but I know that it's either no taxes or it's like very minimal. I think, I think it's no tax. So you can keep everything you make and people that have done it, loved it, like stayed over there for years. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't have a lot of firsthand experience or a lot of knowledge in that area, but I know that people that I've talked to that have done it really, really enjoyed it. That's really cool. Um, that's interesting information. So Ben, I'm we're at 43 minutes. Are you okay continuing on? Oh, no. Yeah, let's do okay. it. I'm Good. loving it. Perfect. Okay. So let's see. Something just happened. No. Ah. Somehow you disappeared, but you're still there, right? I can still see you, yeah. Oh, I think I zoomed in on myself, which is awful. Okay. As long as we're still rolling, <laughs> we'll just keep going. Ah! Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, so I will add in that I traveled with a nurse who went to Saudi Arabia for quite a while. He was on 
like um, private duty assignment with one of the leaders of Saudi Arabia. I actually can't speak too much into his actual role, but like if they stubbed this toe or something, he would look at it and he said he got paid really well and it was really yeah. cool opportunity. And I didn't actually know the details of um, the taxes or anything like that. But that sounds really interesting. That sounds interesting. That's super cool. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Great. Yeah, Brittany asked, how long can I travel for and what happens when my contract is up? We addressed that a little bit, but Ben, what do you have to add to that? Yeah, so, you know, 364 days is the max for one spot. Mm -hmm. 13 weeks is usually the minimum. And uh, what will usually happen is about a month or maybe six weeks out from the end of your contract, if they still need you, then they'll offer an extension. Mm -hmm. And usually it comes from the hospital, you know, usually you don't offer them an extension. Usually it comes from them. Yeah. And then if you're not getting it, I, I always start looking four weeks out, four or five weeks out for my next assignment to get my next one lined up. Cause I don't, I don't really like to take a week off. Like I just back, back to back them. Or if you can plan yourself to where you can be off around the holidays, if you want to go travel home or whatever that looks like. Um, just make sure you make it to where your contract ends because you're not going to get off. They don't, they're not going to give you Thanksgiving or Christmas off. So make sure your contract ends so that you can have those holidays off. Um, just expect if you are working during a contract, most likely you are going to work. I actually was in one contract where I didn't work the holidays. They intentionally didn't want me to work the holidays because they have to pay you more. And so that was convenient, but that only happened one time. And then, um, yeah, what happens, I agree, what happens when your contract is up four weeks out, look for something new. But like Ben said, you better pad your bank account with a couple of weeks of expenses so that in the event that you don't get an assignment, you have some cushion. Mm -hmm. All right, so Stephanie asked, is traveling doable with small kids? I already answered that, yes it is. My children were not school-aged when we traveled, uh, so take that into account. I actually loved traveling with small kids, but other people have different tolerance levels of what's attainable and what's not attainable. If they're easy, not easy kids, it all just depends on the children, I would guess. Uh, what characteristics make a nurse successful as a traveler? That's an excellent question, and that's an important one to be aware of. Uh, we t we've covered some of them, but... Yeah kind of in different areas, so I'll conglomerate them all here into a, a, a perfect Frankenstein of all qualities. Um, so basically what you want to do is you want to be, um, you want to be coachable, which can be a tough one. Like you have to be okay doing it their way. Mm -hmm. You have to be, you have to go with the flow. You have to be flexible. That's huge. I mean, that's like, that's number one. I mean, you have to be competent, right? But let's say that that's, set like we don't have to worry about that being flexible is number one okay. you know because it's just going to be a headache for everyone including yourself like you're going to hate the assignment if you're not flexible mm -hmm. and some of that i learned from experience because i i won't get into all the details but like it's really common for your first assignment to go in and have some of those feelings because you're like you've only seen it done one way they're doing it different ways you know so that's one frustration that maybe even if you get over that one then other things pile up, you're in a different place, stress, you know, whatever. So yeah. it's actually really common for new nurses, new travelers to get frustrated and vocalize that. And that's like not, that's not a good idea. <laughs> Avoid yeah. that. Just be flexible. Whatever they want you to do, do it. Do it gladly and do more, you know, go above. Another really good quality is... Um, you know, it kind of goes into that, but support, you know, support the staff, be kind to them, uh, you know, find ways that you can help the unit and they'll love that. Like if you're treating the unit like your own, then they're going to accept you as their own. Great. That's a really good uh, quality to have. Um, and I think another one is an adventurous spirit, mm -hmm. you know, going out and like, taking advantage of where you're at, you know, hikes, linking up with people, you know, being open to new relation, like new friendships, new relationships, mm -hmm. and just like getting out there and making the most of your four days off. And it's like, it's such a blast. Yes. 
I agree with all of those. What do you love most about traveling? I love the flexibility. I love meeting new people. You know, I love seeing things done in different ways in different places. And I love like just contributing, you know? And so you bring a bunch, a bunch of knowledge with you. And once they know, like, and trust you, maybe on the back half of the assignment, whatever it is, you can, they'll start referencing you and asking you and you can, you know, show them ways, you know, you've seen it done so many different ways and you've seen the best way. Mm -hmm. And um, so then you can start contributing and, and improving their practice by offering up their, your suggestions and then receiving them too and having your practice, you know, advanced as well in that regard. So I love that. And I love, like the pay for me is secondary. Like for me, money is a tool, you know, just lets you do more of like, it lets you have a bigger impact, you know, it gives you more freedom. Like the different locations and meeting different cultures and learning different languages, you know, like mostly just Spanish, you know, is, is the other one that you can learn. Yeah. But, um, you know, in New Orleans, they speak a lot of French and so you can get uh, all, some of that and, uh, it's, it's amazing. Like different food. I'm, I love good food. So like the food, you know. the culture, right? Yeah. There was a big, uh, Somalian culture in, uh, one of my assignments and I had never been around that culture before. And so it was really intriguing. I was, just wanted to learn more. So it was, it was really cool. I agree. All of those things. Fun traveling. Awesome. Love it. So Lindsay asked, probably my favorite question that was submitted. She said, what can we do to better integrate travelers into our units and make them feel like a valued member of our team? That is an awesome question. Is I love it. it. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. And I do have some suggestions. And I want to hear one or two of yours too, Chelsea. Yeah. So I was on an assignment in Detroit, and it was like one of my favorites. The people were amazing. And one of the things that the manager did was like when they had – like a t-shirt giveaway or like gave a little goodie bag, you know, with like a candy bar and a $5 gift card in it. Like she would give that to the travelers as well. And I thought that was really cool because I didn't have that anywhere. And she just treated us like we were her own. And that was actually the contract where I like maxed it out because like, I just felt like family there and I loved it. Um, and another thing that you can do is just like include them. Uh, like if you're having a get together outside of work, you guys are going to eat somewhere or whatever, just like send the invite out. You know, there's a chance that they won't accept, like they've got something already booked or whatever, but just having the, the welcoming, the invitation, you know, being included will feel good whether they end up going or not. Yeah, those are both my things. I was on assignment around Christmas time and the staff all received like a personalized gift and I received one and I'm not a crier, but it brought a tear to my eye. I was like, you thought of me enough to give me this goodie bag too? Like I just, I contacted the manager personally and let her know how much that meant to me as a traveler. And that was actually my very last travel assignment. And I just couldn't express my gratitude enough. And it was something small. I think it was a cup. But um, anyway, just the thoughtfulness of the people on that unit. I maxed out my contract there. And I don't know, just I agree when you're having drinks or going out to wherever, um, having that invitation is really special. That's amazing. All right. So, Lindsay, thanks for that question. We both really appreciated it. Sean asked, as a fellow traveler, what are some things that you do to keep costs down while on assignment? You gave your rental one, but he specifically wanted to know about food, travel, supplies. Yeah, so I uh, just started meal prepping, which I always thought was going to be like a big hassle. But literally, like just every Sunday, I take two hours out of my Sunday. Um, well, actually, not really Sunday right now because I'm working on Monday. I do it on Mondays. Okay. And you can buy like meal prep containers, super cheap on Amazon, get like 14 to 20 of them and make like two day, two meals a day for five to seven days. Mm -hmm. And literally I'm like, got it down to like five bucks a portion for like good food, like chicken, steak, like going all in, you know, like three courses. Well, I guess not three courses, but like a protein, a veggie and a starch or carb. Yeah. And save so much money because I would throw like a couple hundred, 
couple hundies a week on food, you know, like you go to a restaurant, it's like 50 bucks yeah, and you do that one night a week and that's $200, you know, and that's just one meal a day. And then like, if you're in a good spot like LA, then you're looking at hundred, 150 for a meal. You know, if you're really wanting to get those really good spots. And yeah. so I've been like strictly meal prepping and I put myself on what's called a wealth plan, which is just a budget with a different name. Okay. I don't like calling it a budget. Like budget no, makes me cringe. So I call it a wealth plan. It's a wealth plan. <laughs> yes. And, and so like I'm meal prepping, which I'm loving. Like I just throw it in the microwave. I can bring it to work. Mm -hmm. I eat it when I get home. You know, like I got like these egg bites from Costco, which are delicious that you just heat up for like 30 or 40 seconds and you, you can like take them in the car on your way to work. Um, protein shakes, like still eating good in the neighborhood but minimal cost, you know? So that's yeah. my latest, like my latest and greatest is like the meal prep is not that big of a hassle. And you can like go to Costco because the thing with Costco is like, you get so much food, you know, like yeah. everything's in bulk, but it's, if you're meal prepping, you're cooking for the whole week. So you can get those bulk meals and save a ton of money and it's delicious. I agree with those. Um, we used to do uh, one meal out a week. And so when we would find, we'd be in a new place. And so you look at your, you know, Yelp's top rated restaurants and you put them in your calendar for those 13 weeks. It was really fun. And it was something that we got to look forward to on my days off. But yet we meal planned and we were frugal with, because it can suck your money, especially when you're in hot spots like California, Seattle, like their money is ridiculous. The amount of food, the amount of money you can spend on food, right? Yeah. And another thing we did is we had totes that we traveled with and they were just like we put the essentials, like the biggest pan and the biggest pot, the basics, spatulas, those kinds of things. Because if you're going to get a furnished place, they'll furnish that stuff for you. But it costs ridiculous amounts of money for a pot, pan, silverware, some plates like, no, please count me out. Get yourself a little tote, get your kitchen essentials bared, pared down before you leave on travel assignment. And to ask yourself, do I really need this? Nope, toss it out. Do I really need this? Nope, toss it out. And as you kind of pare down what you really need, use that bucket for one whole month before you head out on assignment and you'll be so shocked how much you can make do with so little. Like it's unnecessary. So much of the stuff in our homes is so unnecessary. Mm -hmm. So true. <laughs> We're minimalists by nature, um, my husband and I both. And so when we went traveling, it was so funny. And our kids too, like they knew nothing different. And so when they paired down to two buckets of toys, you know, like little totes of toys, it didn't, Legos, like versatile, get stuff that's a versatile. So yeah, that's my tips and tricks for that. Okay, taxes. Taxes are huge. I don't know how much you want to go into this, Ben, but the policies change constantly. Uh, several people asked how you handle your taxes. Yeah, so there's a couple like mainstay rules. Um, one that's kind of just like unspoken by the IRS, but actually really highly spoken or talked about in the, nursing, the travel realm is that you have to be 50 miles away from your to get your housing stipend. You'd be 50 miles away from your tax home to get your housing stipend. And so the tax home is um, where you pay like to stay if you weren't on assignment. Yeah. And so you have to maintain that. You have to continue to show a paper trail. You have to show proof of dual living expenses. Mm -hmm. So you have to show that you're spending, you're having to spend money to live where I live in Michigan. And I have to show that I'm spending money, having to spend money to live in San Diego. And that can be like, it's okay to have that be rent or, or, well, actually rent. I'm, I'm just saying like, it's okay for that to be your housing expense. So I'm not a, a CPA, so I can't give you all the technical rules, but it's okay for you to just have a housing expense in one place that you pay consistently every month and then have, you know, all your expenses in wherever you're living at currently. So that's a big rule. Um, otherwise you can get like local travel assignments if it's within 50 where it all, but all, all your stipend gets taxed. And so like, nobody wants that. No, figure it out. Get 51 miles away. Yeah. 50.1. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. so, and then another, let me think of other tax, uh, questions that I get asked. 
Um, your housing stipend is, and your per diems are all in tax, which is awesome. You get making more, most of your money that way. So the more of that you can keep through, um, you know, meal planning, meal prep, or finding your own housing, because when the agency finds your housing, they usually take your housing stipend and use that, all of it, regardless. Yeah. Um, uh, so finding your own housing is huge and you get to keep all that. Yeah. And then you're actually your W, when you get your W2, it's all hidden. So like when you get your W two, it's just your hourly rate, and there's like nothing on there about your stipend or your like meal uh, housing stipend, your meal stipend per diems. So, do you have anything to add? I mean, there's like there's actually it's not as complicated as some people make it. You know, like I did my own taxes, and it wasn't that big of a deal. Like I got like the high end TurboTax, where you get like I think it's like 150, 160. And you get like one on one with a CPA if you need it. You get tax help, like live tax help. I just did that, and it was like was able to knock it out. And it was more difficult than like my W two at work, mm -hmm. but it was. I also uh, work for a medical device company, subcontracted, so I had that in there, and it ended up being doable. Okay, that's great. Um, we used TravelTax.com. He, um, Joseph Smith. The reason why I started using him is because he was doing some co um, seminars, free seminars about travel taxes in the state that I was in at the time. And so we went to the hotel and listened to him talk, and he gave so much helpful information. And his price was really reasonable. And so we submitted our stuff to him and he was great. He has a great uh, Q and a page there, like facts, answers, and questions on his website. So if you have specific questions, you, you want to make sure that whatever information you're receiving is legitimate and true. And also make sure that your agency, um, is being super transparent about everything. Sometimes smaller agencies will kind of skirt things under the rug and just make sure you're in the clear. I know the IRS has been kind of hounding uh, some travel nurses a little bit harder recently. So just make sure you have everything super clear, all your questions answered and that you are protecting yourself. So um, I think that's the end. If, oh, have you guys traveled with pets? Yes, I had a dog, both the entire time I traveled, I had a dog, but I also traveled with other people. So what about you, Ben? I've never traveled with animals, but I love dogs. So maybe I, maybe this is like my sign that I need to get one and start traveling with a dog. Well, it's tricky because if you're not living with somebody, like uh, if you're not renting a room from somebody, or if you're not living in a unit that has multiple travelers in it or something of that nature, then your dog's locked up for 12, 13, 14 hours at a time. Yeah, um, it's so tough. Cats are, you know, super manageable. We The first time we traveled, they traveled with a dog and a cat. But again, my husband was with me, so it's different. Um, but I had f traveling friends who would just, we would say, oh, you need me to let your dog out tonight? Okay, go take the dog out for a walk, and it was fine. But without those connections, it's tricky. Um, there's dog walking services and all those good things that you can definitely take part of it's uh there's so many resources in our wonderful world of technology all right so that's all the travel nurse questions that i have been submitted and have come in live i want to know i know you have a huge passion for mentoring new nurses tell us a little bit about that and what you're up to with that no doubt so uh to lead into that i'll tell you kind of where it came from Please do. You and I, when we first started the interview, you said something that struck a chord with me, and you talked about how in nursing school, we learn a little about a lot, and then when you get into nursing, like when you get into being a core staff or being a, a staff nurse, yeah. you really learn how much you didn't learn, or you, you really learn how much you hadn't learned, Right. and that was the case for me. You know, like I thought I was going to change the world. I was going to come out swinging. I was going to be a golden nurse. I was going to be prepped and ready to go, like just add water. And, and that happened to me. Like I got to being a, a, a staff nurse and I was like, wow, like I actually am still learning so much. There's so much I don't know. There's still a huge learning curve here. And on one hand, it was frustrating because I wasn't able to contribute as much as I wanted to contribute. Mm -hmm. I was going home not feeling like I was performing at the level that I was expecting myself to. Okay. And the thing that 
turned it for me was this amazing nurse. Her name's Kathy and she is the best ever. And she's just like caring, coaching grandma. And <laughs> I loved her. She was amazing. And so when I got onto night shift, she like took me under her wing. She pointed out areas where I was doing really well and built up those strengths. And then like, like my areas I needed to work on, she was supportive in those areas. And she just like was genuinely concerned with me doing well. And it totally flipped my experience. You know, I went from frustration and decreased hope and, and feeling, you know, incompetent that I like this, I just, you know, I'm not performing at the way I want to, like this wasn't, maybe this wasn't for me to like totally flipped at 180. And mentorship did that for me. And there's more, you know, lots of things that I could go into that really made that an impactful event for me. Mm -hmm. But it was huge. And so now as a nurse for eight years, I'm like, that's what I needed. And I love to provide it. I've always loved to precept. Why not create a group that that offers that that mentorship, that coaching, that that encouragement, that perspective that you need as a nurse because here's the thing and I'll I'll wrap up with this and then we'll touch on a little bit of what the group has to it but as nurses we're great at building an exterior palace you know certification CCRN SCRN CNRN uh, clinical knowledge really understanding complex concepts and being able to relay those complex concepts to patients or patient family members. We do an awesome job at that. And we have all this exterior um, accolades and greatness. And it's awesome. Like we need that clinical strength. That's important. But what we do poorly is take care of the interior, you know, like interior, we're a college dorm room, you know, like self care mindset, um, you know, giving ourselves some grace on a bad day, whatever it is, like nurses, just myself included, historically don't do a good job of that. Mm -hmm. We give and we give and we give and we give, but who's there to give back to us, you know, like to give into us. And that starts, you know, part of that is, is us being open to it and being willing to receive it. Yeah. Um, but that's what I am aiming to do in the group is to offer some perspective for new nurses and seasoned nurses alike to uh, uh, like our tagline is we are and we make next level nurses. So that's the name of the group is next level nurses and create an environment and a scenario for that where, you know, the eight years of learning that I have trying to condense that down into uh, a number of months and really help new nurses. Uh, I love seeing new nurses succeed, help them climb that initial learning curve because it's like too expensive to learn from your own mistakes like it's way better to learn from somebody else's mistakes and so that's the kind of group i'm creating it's actually really new um it's probably just under a month old and so we're still just kind of building that out and i'm doing similar to what you're doing right now you know having an interview and tomorrow is a uh, medical device hiring manager oh interesting and so that'll it's going to be a really good interview you know talking about online interviewing tips and how to make yourself hireable, how to like best set yourself up to transition from being a nurse to being in medical devices. So that'll be a really fun one, but just providing things like that, like week weekly expert interviews, encouraging content and, um, you know, moving towards like mentorship and how to incorporate that. You've done an awesome job with that. And I love what you have going on there. So that's uh, what we got going on. Next Level Nurses is the name of the group. So exciting stuff. There's huge things ahead. And it's like acorn status right now, but it's a thriving acorn. I love it. And, you know, the energy you bring to the group is really great. I love, you know, when I see you putting in for effort into uh, communicating with people in the Tribarian group. I know you're doing that times 10 uh, in your own group. And so I just really love all the information you share and the tips and tricks. And, you know, I, there is, and there could never be too many people out there trying to give back to nurses. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if there's 500 nursing Facebook groups, um, great, more power to everybody who's trying to reach out to even one single new nurse or struggling nurse or nursing student. Like 
I really appreciate the work that you're putting in and your heart in giving back to our profession. So thank you, Ben. Thank you for tuning in. This has been a long Q&A. Those of you who are here with us, thank you. And Never Stop Learning Tribe, thank you so much, Ben, for, for uh, sharing your knowledge with us. It was a blast being here. This is awesome. We got to do it again in the, in the future. Sounds great. Have a great day, tribe.